You're listening to Rabbi Arya Wolby, Director of Torch, the Torah Outreach Resource Center of Houston. This is the Jewish Inspiration Podcast. All right, welcome back, everybody, to the Muster Masterclass. Today we're going to discuss a new topic, but also continuing with the halachas that we were talking about previously, we talked about the halachas of good character traits. We spoke about the halachas of, of proper speech. And now we are going to talk about the halachas of intentions, that one's intentions should be for the sake of heaven. One's intentions should be for the sake of heaven. What does that mean? So the, there's a verse in Proverbs, chapter 3, verse 6, which says the following. In all of your ways, know Hashem. Know Hashem. Our sages of blessed memory said, what is a small or a short passage upon which, upon which all the fundamentals of Torah depend? It is this. In all of your ways, you must know Hashem. Which means, Sha'afilu, that even in your own paths, when you are engaged with your own physical needs, da es Hashem, know Hashem. You should know Hashem in everything that you do. And do the things that you do for the sake of Hashem. May His name be blessed. Kegon, for example, eating and drinking, and walking and sitting and going to sleep and arising, engaging in relations, in conversing with others, in all of your physical needs. All of them should be performed in the service of our Creator. Or to accomplish something that will enable that service of Hashem. You see, the world that we live in divides things up. Now I'm going to synagogue. So now now I'm going to do my thing. But when I'm eating, I'm just eating. When I'm doing business, I'm, it's just business. No, 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 no. Our sages tell us, You have to know Hashem in everything that you do, in every action that you're busy with. You're busy negotiating contracts? Da'ehu, no Hashem. You're on the beach, vacationing with your spouse? Da'ehu, no Hashem. A person should never be in a situation in their life where they forget about Hashem, where they don't recognize that there's a Hashem. I remember my first time going to Mexico with my wife on vacation. First time. It's not like I go every, you know what I'm saying. So... I was there, and I remember the first time I ate there. There's kosher restaurants there. And I remember, I was like, you know what? It's amazing. The same Hashem that I praise when I'm in Jerusalem, the same Hashem that I praise when I am in Houston, the same Hashem I praise when I'm in Mexico. Hashem is everywhere. The aesthetics might change, but the, the God, creator of heaven and earth, is everywhere. But there's even more than that. Not only when we eat and drink. It's not only that we should know that there's a Hashem in front of us. Shiviti Hashem l'negdit I should have the placement of God right before my eyes at all times. Not only that. But we should do it for the sake of serving Hashem. You see, let's take vacation, for example. We mentioned vacation. Let's talk about it for a second. Vacation can be a very, very holy thing. Because why are we vacationing? To re-energize so that we can continue to serve Hashem. If we continue working, 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 and we don't take that break, we can blow a tire. Right? We, can, we can burn out. A person has to take a break so that they can maintain their positive output for the sake of the Almighty. A person who works nonstop is going to burn out. So our sages already tell us how important it is. There's a time like Yom Tov, holidays, to take it easy. 
we have today, there are people who are like, oh, I better use up my vacation days or I lose them. So vacation is not even a, a time to relax. It's like a, a chore. I have to do it. June 1st, we go on vacation. No. It should be that I need to re-energize myself to serve Hashem. And then the entire vacation is one big mitzvah. And while you're on that vacation, it's not that we disengage from the Almighty. On the contrary, we bring the Almighty with us. And we daven three times a day. Our schedule is a little lighter. But everything that we do should be with the recognition, with the, with the cognizance of Hashem's presence at all times. I was once on vacation. And at the kosher restaurant, we met this nice Jewish couple. And where are you from? I'm not going to say where they're from. They're from a, a larger Jewish community than Houston. And typical, seemingly normal Jews. And to- seemingly Torah observant as well. But then they asked us information. Where are we going? Where's, where's our, you know, what... We said, oh, tomorrow we're going to this and this place. We have tickets. We got to, to go to this and this uh, attraction. And they said, oh, maybe we'll come. Do you mind? Do we come? I said, you can do what you want. No problems. We don't own the rides. We don't own the, uh, you know, the place. You can do whatever you want. You want to come with us? Come with us. We'll tell you when we're going. In any event, so they, came, they ended up coming with us. And it was a little bit of a shock to me because this first halacha, that the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch brings here, to know God in every place that you are, may have been overlooked by these people in the way they were dressed, particularly the woman. So She would never walk around her community like that. She would never walk around any place where there is other people like that. But I'm away from everyone. I'm on vacation. I can do what I want. It's a little bit of a sense of like, God's not here, right? He doesn't see me here. He only sees me when I'm in Brooklyn. No, heaven forbid. We have to recognize that God is everywhere. And just because my environment, my culture, my people may not be here with me, Hashem is everywhere. And it shouldn't change the standard of our commitment. On the contrary, it should strengthen because there's a weak environment. We have to strengthen ourselves. So now we're going to elaborate a little bit on these activities that we mentioned previously. Achil v'shtiyah, Kate said, how should one eat and drink in the service of Hashem? Ein tzorach lomar. It goes without saying that one may not eat or drink that which is forbidden. God forbid, right? No one, you can't eat things that are not kosher. So that we're not talking about. We're not talking about, oh, you should eat kosher food. That's obvious. So what are we talking about? It says to serve Hashem when you eat and drink as well. How do we go about doing that? It says, rather the supplies even when eating and drinking that which is permitted. And when eating and drinking due to thirst or hunger, if one ate or drank for his own pleasure, it is not commendable. Rather, his intention with his eating and drinking should be that he have the strength to serve his creator. Therefore, he should not eat only all that his palate desires, that which tastes good to him, that which looks good to him, like a dog or a donkey. They see food, they eat food. Rather, he should eat things that are beneficial and good for physical health. There are men of good deeds who before they eat declare, I want to eat and drink now so that I can be healthy and strong. Why? For the service of my creator, may his name be blessed. So the, what they're doing is they're taking this food with the intention and with the purpose and with the focus that this food is here to give me strength so that I can serve God. Yeah, it can taste delicious. God wants it to taste delicious. In fact, we talked this morning in the Parsha Review podcast, 
Parshas Naso. We said that the Nazir, after he finished his period of, abst- of abstaining from physical worldly pleasures, which is a minimum of 30 days, he had to bring an offering. What type of offering? A sin offering. Why a sin offering? God gives you pleasures and you limit yourself from them? God wants you to enjoy and you're limiting yourself. That's not what God has in mind. That's that's similar to sinning against the Almighty. Or in fact, as our sages tell us, it is an actual sin for one to derive themselves from pleasure. So we're not saying here that a person should minimize his eating, but how do we make it, you ready for this word? How do we holify? How do we make it holy? It's my own word. I can make up words. How do we make it holy? We're eating anyway. You're going to satiate your body anyway. We can just add a little bit of intention, a little bit of focus to the food we eat, that it not just be to fill up our desires, but rather to serve Hashem. It's just a little change of intention, which is the topic of tonight's class. It's about the intention. So why did these people do this? These great holy Jews, what they do is they before they eat, they say, God, we might get carried away with our food, but just know what our intention is. My intention is so that I can have strength to serve you. That changes the entire food now, becomes a vessel, a vehicle through which we're being uplifted. So it's not just food which is to satiate our hunger and to fill up our body and refuel our tanks, but it's now here to serve Hashem. That's a whole different type of eating. There's many more layers which hopefully one day we'll get to when we talk about eating. The Hasidic masters talk a lot about eating. Not to get fat and, and to get, you know, fill up our stomachs and be filled with food. That's not the purpose. Our sages talk about this in the sense of how do we elevate ourselves in the process of eating. Eating is a very beautiful thing in Judaism. In fact, we're commanded to eat every Shabbos, our finest foods. You go to the store and you see a nice kosher steak, go buy it for Shabbos. Actually, you know what Hashem says, by the way, about that? He says, that's my account. I pay for it. Put it on me. And Hashem repays us for the food we buy for Shabbos. Hashem wants us to get the finest wines, the greatest meats and fish and delicacies. Hashem wants us to enjoy. There's a mitzvah to enjoy. We'll learn the halachas of Shabbos. It'll tell us about the importance of having delicacies on Shabbos. Things that, special foods, the special foods. These are food, I, my, I do this for my children all the time. I'll go before Shabbos and I'll buy something special just for Shabbos. If it's a certain treat, a certain candy, a certain chocolate, a certain something, this is just for Shabbos. Make it special for Shabbos. Now, of course, we have a lot of things that are special for Shabbos, but for the children to understand, there's some things that are just for Shabbos. We do this particularly with with, uh, cereals. We have Shabbos cereals, like all the sweet ones, the unhealthy ones. Yeah, so that's for Shabbos. The fruity pebbles, the cocoa pebbles, and all of those, right? You know, the the frosted flakes, exactly, with tons and tons of sugar. That's for the kids. They understand Shabbos is a special time. My children figured out a technique. They try to persuade me, say, like, today's a special day because, you know, okay, if it's somebody's birthday, that's an easy one, but because we're only, like, 25 days left to school, so it's a special day. You know, every day becomes a Shabbos for them. But the idea is to make it special, to make it. It's not just to eat food, but to eat food and the intention of that food to elevate us as well. Halacha number three. Hayeshiva ve'akima ve'halicha ketzad. How does one engage in sitting and standing and walking in the service of Hashem? So we all know, we all have to sit down 
and we all have to walk and we all have to go places. So how do we do that for the service of Hashem? It goes without saying that one should not sit in the company of scoffers. We already mentioned in the previous weeks about the devastating influence of people who mock others and that we should avoid being in the confines, in the environment with other, with other people who laugh at others. And should, one should not stand in the path of the sinful and should not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Rather, this applies even when participating in the counsel of the, of the upright. You find righteous people, even then, standing in a place where the righteous are present and walking in the counsel of the wholesome. If a person does, does this for his own benefit, to fulfill his wants and desires, it is not commendable. So you're dealing with good people, you're dealing with righteous people. If it's for your own intentions, for your own good, for your own benefits, it's not commendable. Rather, even this should be done for the sake of heaven. Now, is a very important, important piece of information here. Just because your intentions aren't perfect doesn't mean you should avoid doing good things. Well, don't say, you know, I can't help myself. You know, I wish I could give charity just altruistically and not want any, you know, any recognition. So I'm just not going to donate till I have the proper recognition, till I have the proper intention, sorry, till I have the proper intention. I'm not going to donate till I have the proper intention. A person shouldn't do that. Look, I don't have proper kavana with my tefillin, so I'm not going to put on tefillin. God forbid. Even if a person doesn't have the right intention, should still do it. But hope and pray that they have the ability to change the intention, that the intention should be righteous, that the intention should be wholesome. Nevertheless, even if one is not able to act purely for the sake of Hashem, he should not avoid these practices because from performing good deeds, even not for the sake of heaven, a person will come to do them for the right reason for the sake of heaven. So if a person gets into the habit of doing good things, what happens is they start acting in the right way and it has an influence on them. They did many studies on people who all they did was change their attire. Now today everyone goes to work in their flip-flops and shorts and and a t-shirt. No one's formal anymore. So what happens is the way they act is also informal. But they did a study of people who dressed in a suit and tie instead, and their whole behavior changed to match the way they were dressed. It has an influence. Yes. So, you know, all of those pictures came out. How does that work with with working from home? You know, those pictures came out during COVID when people were on Zoom the whole time. So they'd be on a shirt and tie uh, up above the camera lens and in their shorts or pajamas below the camera. So I say, look, when you, when for me, I have this many times where like my wife says, well, you're not going to a class right now. Like, what do you need to be in a suit and tie? Well, I'm, I'm always on, right? A Jew is always on. So I feel like it's part of my, my obligation to, carry myself a certain way. Right, so there's a, a certain a certain decorum that a person should carry, even if there's nobody else around, but the fact that I'm doing something which is holy and dignified, like praying, right, you're praying, just because there's no one around doesn't mean you should pray, you know, in your bathrobe in, barefoot, right? A person should be dressed. You're talking, you're talking to the Almighty. It has nothing to do with people. You're carrying yourself, hopefully, we all carry ourselves as representatives of the Almighty, and as such, we should be appropriately dressed. So that again, that doesn't mean that we should be wearing a long coat and uh, and a hat all day. That's not what it's referring to. But we should act in it. We should carry ourselves in a way in in a way that's dignified. We all know that if we go to a business meeting, we go for an interview, we'll go in a suit and tie, and like we're going like you know to conquer the world. 
So why does that change when we're sitting and working from home? I don't think it should change. It puts you in a frame of mind. I'm a believer that children should have some type of uniform in school. So for, for, for the main reason, for the main reason, I have just one specific reason. And, and well, first for self-respect, I think it looks good, but that's a side note. Uh, I think the main reason should be that there shouldn't, there shouldn't be jealousy among the children. And I feel that sometimes the children are looking, this one can afford fancier clothes, this one can afford, it can't afford those fancier clothes. Like this is no competition and everyone is basically on the same playing field and the kids can be kids. Uh, their uniqueness doesn't need to shine uh, in first grade by the clothes they dress. They don't have to wear, you know, Louis Vuitton shoes to school in first grade. So I'm a fan of that personally, but I don't think that I, I'm generally not a big fan of rules to begin with when it comes to, to schools, to having too many rules. Let the kids just live life, you know? So a little contradiction there, but that's, that's life, contradictions. All right, let's continue. That's also true. Parents have to be more responsible to not act like children. Parents should act like parents. Parents today, you know, there's this meme, which I, I, I kind of relate to, but it's sad that parents should feel this way. They have a picture of a, I think it's like some chimpanzee dancing. And that's what they, like you see it, all the parents are sending it to each other the first day of school. And when the kids are back in school, that's like the, now the parents are on vacation, you know, and they're like dancing. So, but the truth is like this, we should, we should spend as much time as we can with our children. We shouldn't be with our phones when we're with our children and we should give them as much attention and, and spend quality time with them. It's very, very important because we're never going to get a second chance for this. It's, I, I took out one of my children last week. I picked them up from school. I think I mentioned that I did this. And we had a special time together, just the two of us. And I sent him into a 7-Eleven right down the road. On, on the way to where we were going, I sent him into 7-Eleven. I gave him a $5 bill. I said, buy anything you want. Go inside and go buy whatever you want. You want to buy a Slurpee? You want to buy an ice cream? You want to buy a can of Coke? Whatever you want. $5, you can spend up, up to $5. So while he went in, I was talking to my son in Israel. And he said, oh, He's having his special day with you. I said, did I ever do that with you? I was like, worried. Oh. He says, yeah, of course. I remember we used to go and get donuts from Randall's and, and go have a catch. You know, and the idea is just to take them out of school. They're doing well, thank God, just so that they can feel that bond, that closeness. That we, it's, not, it's not all business. Go do your homework. Go to bed. Da, da, da. You know, it's like to build that relationship as much as possible because they're not always going to be little kids. They grow up very fast, I can tell you. All right. Now, so we talked about walking when a person walks. By the way, we have a mitzvah in the Torah that we should learn. That you should teach Torah to your children. When you're sitting at your home. And when you're traveling on the way. And when you lay down, when you arise. That means that a person at every moment should be busy thinking, contemplating, talking with Hashem. It's not just when I'm in synagogue, that's when I talk to God. No, 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 no. I learn when I go to the Torch Center and when I sign on the Zoom class. No, not only then. Because Torah should be a constant for a Jew. Wherever we are, Vishinantam, we should teach them to our children and we should study them wherever we are. Whether we are traveling, yeah, we should take a little book along the way in our bag so we can learn something while we're traveling. You're going to the bank. Take a Mishnah with you. Take a halacha. Listen to a podcast. We shouldn't be vacant at any time, at any moment, from connecting with our Creator. Because what happens when we are? One leads to the other, to the other, to the other. Before we know it, it's six months since we came to a class. And for whatever reason, we stop going to synagogue. And one thing leads to the next, and we have this apathy 
And we know the process of how this works. It goes, and then it becomes a hatred, and then it becomes a, a disliking to anybody who does do it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's important for us to constantly keep ourselves spiritually connected. That doesn't only mean when we're in the synagogue and when we go to Torah classes. Now, how do we lay, how do we sleep in the service of Hashem? It goes without saying that at a time when a person can be engaged in Torah study or the fulfillment of mitzvahs, if he indulges himself in sleep for his own pleasure, that this is not an appropriate thing to do. You can be doing good things and instead you're just laying in bed going to sleep, lazing around. Right? A person, if you're able to do good things, you should be busy doing good things. Rather, this applies even at a time when one is exhausted and needs to sleep so as to rest his body from an exhausted state. If he does this for his physical pleasure, it is not commendable. Rather, he should intend when allowing his eyes to sleep, he should allow himself to sleep and his body to rest for the purpose of his physical health and so that his mind not be too unsettled for the Torah study that needs to be done properly. And if you can't function properly, you can't serve God properly. Why? Because due to a lack of sleep, you're not going to be able to serve Hashem properly. So again, you're going to go to sleep anyway. You can just, before you close your eyes and hit the pillow, you can say, Hashem, please recharge my batteries so that I can serve you tomorrow again. So I can serve you and do good things for you. So it's not just sleep because I'm tired, I'm going to take a break now. It's much more than that. I'm going to sleep now so that I can serve Hashem tomorrow with more strength. All it is is intention. You're going to do the same exact action. But it should be with the proper intention to serve Hashem. Not to push God out. God, you're not here when I sleep. In fact, the halach has many laws about how a person should sleep. Yeah, you're supposed to sleep on your left side. And before you get out of bed in the morning, you should turn over to your right side. And the halacha has an entire reasoning behind it, how for health purposes, for spiritual purposes, a person should sleep in that way. They should get into a habit of sleeping on their left side and then turning to the right side before they wake up. Of course, if someone wants to learn, learn, listen to this podcast or any listening and, and, and fall asleep like that, I look, there are times where I, there, there are many times that I'll put on a podcast and, and listen to a class and, and fall asleep. No problem. There's nothing wrong with that. On the contrary, the Torah, the, the halacha says that one should fall asleep with words of Torah in their mind and someone should wake up with the first thing being words of Torah. All right, my dear friends, let's continue. How does one engage in marital relations in the service of Hashem? It goes without saying that one may not sin, God forbid. Rather, this applies even with regard to the marital obligations that he is commanded by the Torah. We know that a man gets married, he gives his wife a ketubah. What does it say in that ketubah? That he will provide all of her physical needs, her spiritual and emotional needs, and also her marital needs. If he does it for his physical pleasure or to fulfill his desire, then it is a disgraceful act. And even if his intention is so that he should have children who will serve him and take his place, it is not commendable. Rather, he should intend, when having marital relations, that he should have children for the service of his creator and for the sake of fortifying his body and to fulfill his mitzvah of marital obligations in the manner of one who discharges his obligations. So we can talk about this in another class, the basis of responsibility that a man has towards his wife 
uh, it's not only when we're dealing with a physical relationship, but the other aspects as well, that a man signs a contract in his ketubah, he's obligating himself to take care of his wife. Not to take care of himself, take care of his wife. It's the obligation for him to provide an experience that's proper for his wife. And if a person does it only for themselves, the halacha says a terrible, terrible things about a ari doires va'echel. If someone is like a lion who pounces, eats, and runs away, that it's a terrible thing. And we can understand how this is relatable when we're talking about relations between a husband and wife, that it shouldn't be in the same regard. It should be with a tremendous amount of care, of love, of devotion to our spouse, respectively. And and to do it in the way that the Torah commands us to do it, where it is uplifting for the couple. We just learned about this today, that when we talked about the month of Sivan, that when a husband and wife are in unity with love, it's like twins. Twins are like, it's, you become, it's like two entities, but part of one one connecting soul. Okay, so now halacha number six. How does one engage in conversation in the service of Hashem? Ain't Sorach Lomar. It goes without saying that one may not speak Lashon Hara, Rechilos, Makri, or vulgar speech, God forbid, that we mentioned previously, that one shouldn't talk like that. Ela filu l'saper b'divrei chachamim. Rather, even if when even when speaking words of the wise, his intention must be for the service of his creator. That is, for something that will enable one to serve Hashem. So when we're talking, it shouldn't be a, just a chatter. It should definitely not be mockery. It shouldn't be vulgar speech. It shouldn't be Rechilus talking about other people. It shouldn't be speaking Lashon Hara, speaking slander about another person. So we're using our mouth. Great, but could you use it to uplift people, to inspire people? Could you use it for words of Torah? Or is, should it be used for vulgar language? And this is what the halacha tells us and reminds us that a person needs to be so careful not to allow their mouths to be used for inappropriate speech. You're going to use it to talk. It should be used properly to talk. We see the Chavetz Chaim, our sages tell us, our, the, the pe- people who are around the Chavetz Chaim, I've heard said that the Chavetz Chaim was a big schmoozer. We think the Chavetz Chaim, oh, he wrote the book of Lashon Hara and how you shouldn't speak inappropriately about other people. He probably didn't talk to anybody. He didn't let anybody do, oh, what, 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 oh, right now, nobody should talk to me. But we see that it's not how, it's not how he lived his life. Chavetz Chaim was a very talkative person but he was very, very careful to use his words for positive and not to talk about other people and not to go around peddling bad information about people. Oh, did you hear this guy? Did you hear about that guy? You always have that guy in a shul, perhaps, maybe, you know, running around by the kiddish, telling everybody pieces of information of the years from this and her from that. That's a peddler. That's a peddler of words. And that's what the Torah tells us not to to do. You shouldn't be a peddler of information about other people. Okay. And what does that do? What does that do? Just one second. What does that do? That allows for a person to dedicate their speech for the right intentions, for the right things. Yes. Look, I had a woman who sat in this class here and she told me, she says, I don't know what to do, Rabbi. We just learned about the laws of Lashon Hara. And she says, I'm just realizing that my friends all get together every week. We meet at Starbucks, and all we do is talk about everyone. We talk about everyone. She says, and that's the joy. The joy is that we get together and talk about everybody. And now you're telling me that it's for, forbidden. What do I do? Well, but uh, you know, they're like, oh, why are you changing the topic? We want to talk about how she looked uh, at the wedding. And we want to talk about you know that funny person who was there. And we want to talk about... 
you know, and people like to talk and people like to schmooze. And I'll tell you the main reason, I think we touched on this last week, is that the problem is, is that when we talk about other people, what we're essentially doing is putting other people down. And that's not a healthy way for a person to grow. A person needs to elevate themselves, not push others down. The only way we will really grow is not by talking about others and not by commenting or disparaging others, but rather by talking good things, not about other people. Don't talk about other people. Don't get in the habit of discussing what other people do, what other people say, whatever the people see, where other people go. Just don't talk about other people. Did you hear they went on that vacation? Oh, yeah, sure. Nobody knows what I know about him, right? Everyone, everyone has, you know, I'll tell you, it's it's really interesting. You know, now that I'm a uh, ready, now almost three years as a first responder, and I get, I you know, one of the things that we learn is very serious is HIPAA, the Privacy Act about not sharing information. There are many times that people will come over to me and they'll say, oh, I saw you in front of so-and-so's house. Uh, what's going on? And you know what I tell them? If I was in front of your house, would you want me to tell other people? Would you want me to share information about you? You're privileged to a lot of information that you cannot share with anyone. And you learn that even as a rabbi, not even, even more so as a rabbi, people share personal things and we have not HIPAA, but we have RIPA, Rabbinic Privacy Act. We got to be very quiet, and you can't share any information with anyone. And people ask, and you can be sitting in the room, and they're talking, and they're they're yapping, and you can't disclose anything, even though you know the story is true or not true. You have to make believe you know nothing. You cannot share. You cannot be part of the conversation. Yes. Yeah, of course. The Chavetz Chaim says that a person must remove himself from a circle of people who are scoffers, people who are mockers, people who are speaking Lashon Hara. You definitely have to remove yourself from their company. You should be very, very careful with who you hang out with. You should be very, very careful. Yeah. It's very possible that they're getting their values from the Torah. The Torah tells us exactly how we need to behave. And sometimes, many times, the laws correspond with the Torah. The modern-day laws of, uh, of uh, libel and all of that is based on the Torah. The Torah tells us how to deal with this and the prohibitions of this. All right, so there's one more halacha here, and that is v'chein kishuhu osik v'masav maton. Similarly, when one is engaged in business, or in an income-producing venture, he should not think about only accumulating money. Rather, he should work so that he should have what he needs to provide for his family. Remember that. Not to lose the focus of that. We're, we're doing this so that we can provide for our family. And to give charity and to raise our children for Torah study. Why does a person work? To make money? No. Why does a person work? To get a nice vacation? No. We work so that we can maintain our lives as servants of Hashem. Our lives and our children's lives. So now when you go to work, the intention with which you go to work could be a big game changer. I can go with the intention I want to make money so that I can buy things. I can buy a car and I can go on a nice vacation or I can do the same work I'm doing but go with a different intention. That intention is I'm going so that I can have the peace of mind so I can serve Hashem. I'm going so that I can have enough income and now what happens? Going to work is a mitzvah now. The same work that you were doing yesterday now becomes a mitzvah because you're working with the intention so that you can serve Hashem or so that you can give charity. Imagine this. If a person declares, like people I know who do this, before they sign a deal, I had someone come over to me recently. He says to me, Rabbi, I need blessing in a deal I'm about to close. I'm committing to you a certain percentage of this deal. And if any money I make from this deal, I will give a certain percentage to your organization. 
And it's an amazing thing because now the whole deal becomes holy. Think of the ministering angels in heaven. Should they succeed this deal or not? Well, look at the deal. It's not only for himself. He already committed. He already committed the charity that's going to go to the organization. And then I found out that they weren't only making that commitment to Torch, they were making it to several other Jewish organizations. Now, I hope the deal goes through. I hope the deal is successful. But, but you see, that's a positive way of where the business doesn't stay a business. The business now becomes an entity of holiness. Where now, when I go to work and dealing with, uh, can you, you know, buying another container, selling another, writing another, another, uh, you know, under underwriting another deal, or not underwriting another deal, running the credit isn't that's all nonsense now. Now you're doing the work of Hashem because the intention with which you go to work is so that you can serve God, so that your family can serve God, so that you can give charity. That's a whole different intention in the regular mundane activities of, of li- or earning a livelihood. Klalo shel davar, the general principle that should guide a person in this matter is that a person is obligated to take note of and consider the various courses of action that he takes and to weigh the value of each of his actions on the scales of his mind when he sees an action that will lead to the service of his creator he should do it and if he sees that it will pull him away from the service of his creator he should not do it one who conducts himself this way will find himself serving his creator all of his days even when he is sitting, standing, or walking, when he is doing business, even when he is eating and drinking, and even with his marital relations and when attending to his physical needs, he's serving Hashem. So if a person is living his life, it's, a, it's changing the focus, changing the intention. Why am I eating? Why am I drinking? Why am I sleeping? Why am I working? Why am I going on vacation? Why am I doing all the things that I'm doing? Ah, it's not only for me anymore. It's not for my own personal benefit here. I'm doing it to fulfill the will of Hashem. And by the way, that also applies, like we said, in marital relations. Fulfilling the will of Hashem is that we be selfless, particularly men. With regard to this matter, our sages of blessed memory commanded, and they said in Ethics of our fathers. V'chol ma'asecha yu l'shem shemaim. All your actions should be for the sake of heaven. After pursuing this path his entire life, Zokef Rabbeinu HaKadosh etz pa'os of Lamala. Rabbeinu HaKadosh extended his fingers heavenward. V'shas misoso at the time of his passing. V'omar and he said, G'alui v'yadua l'fanecha shalo nehenesi mohem elo l'shem shemaim. Rabbeinu HaKadosh, when he was dying, raised his hands to the heaven. And he said, It is revealed and known before you, Hashem, that I have derived pleasure from the efforts of my fingers only for the sake of heaven. I was committed every moment of my life for the service of Hashem. So even eating ice cream can be a service of Hashem if it's for the right intention. A person can find a way to bring God into our life. So going out with friends doesn't have to be just a evening of lightheadedness. It could be an uplifting evening. It could be an evening. It doesn't mean you have to go to a Torah class together. But it could be so that there can be more friendship, so you could remove those tensions that were, you know, show love to your fellow mankind. But the idea here is that our intentions should always be everything that you do, if you only cha- change the intention, it changes everything. And we know, they say the, the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Right? People, oh, he meant well. No, no, no. 
meant well for himself, meant well for you, or meant well for heaven. We all have the ability to pave the road to heaven with those good intentions. It doesn't have to be at someone else's expense. On the contrary, the Torah wants us to act in the best way possible. That's what it's all about. It's not about limiting our ability to succeed. It's not about limiting our pleasure in this world. On the contrary, it's maximizing the pleasure in this world and utilizing every pleasure there is to the service of Hashem. So Hashem should bless us all, that we should enjoy every pleasure that God gave us, and we should use them as a vehicle, as a vessel through which we connect to the Almighty. So it's not just a physical pleasure on its own, but rather it becomes now a spiritual connector between us and the Almighty. Hashem should always succeed our ways in good health, with happiness, and always feeling that special connection, that special bond with the Almighty. Amen. All right, any questions, my dear friends? No. So our sages tell us like this. Let's say, I've given this example. You'll remember this example. Imagine someone asks you, for a favor and you're conflicted because you really don't want to do it. It's a Sunday afternoon. You want to watch your Miami Dolphins game. So, so you want to watch and you're a big sports guy and they're like, Oh, really wants me to pick him up from the airport right in the middle of the game. I really don't want to do that. So, but let's say you say, you know what? I'll do it. I'm going to be selfless and I'm going to do it. No problem. Send me your flight information. The guy calls back 20 minutes later. He says, you know what? Never mind. I see that one of my neighbors is on the flight with me. And I'm going to get a ride with him. One second. Do you get reward for wanting to do it, for the intention to do that mitzvah? Of course you do. You will get full reward because you had the intention to be selfless and you're going to get a massive reward because for you it's such a special thing for you to give up on your football game. And you did that. Even though you didn't actually do it, you did that with your intention and desire to want to help another person out. Okay, so what's your question? If, if at the moment that a person says that they really mean it, then, then it would be counted as if they did it. But if they really didn't and they wouldn't come through with it and it's just lip service, I don't think so. I don't think so. So I, 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 wanna, I, wanna tell, I don't know if I told you the story recently, but I just heard the story and it, it shocked me. There's a Palestinian gas station owner in New Jersey who has many Jews who come fill up gas there. And he figured out a good scheme. He got caught eventually, but he figured out a good scheme. What he did was every Jewish guy who looked like a yeshiva guy, white shirt, black pants, he looks like a religious Jew, he has yarmulke, he's got pay. Us. You know, it's not, we're not hiding it, right? So he'd go over to him and say, you know, one of your people looked exactly like you, filled up gas, never paid. He just drove right off. And he said, really, he said, every single guy asked him, how much did he owe you? He says, $40. Here's $40 for him. Here's for my gas. $40 for him. Here's for my gas. $40 for him. My guy. Guys, until eventually, they quite, imagine a thousand people do that. You made 40 grand. That's a lot. But the, but the, the amount of responsibility that everyone feels as a Jewish person, that another Jew wouldn't pay their bill, I'm going to pay for them. Like you did. You saw those people didn't pay their tip, which is the mensch thing to do. So you paid it. It's, it shows the tremendous virtue of us as a people. And it shows, sadly, the terrible, uh, you know. All right, my dear friends, have a fabulous evening. Thank you. Have a good night.
You've been listening to the Jewish Inspiration Podcast, a Torch production. Become a supporter at torchweb.org because your assistance enables more Torah learning around the globe. To find more lessons offered by Torch, please visit torchpodcasts.com.